allow me to introduce one of the most respected names in academia, Sir Richard Blundell. Awarded a CBE in 2006 and a knighthood in 2014, his contributions to his field are extraordinary. Professor Sir Richard Blundell is the David Ricardo Chair of Political Economy at the University College London. And among other distinguished positions, he was formerly president of the Royal Economic Society. He is widely known for developing new microeconometric techniques for the study of dynamic panel data models and the non-parametric analysis of individual decisions. Together with the Institute of Fiscal Studies, he launched the Deaton Review with the aim to further understand inequalities and what we, what we must consider in terms of policy formulation. It is our absolute pleasure today to host Professor Blundell and hear his stance and his work regarding this pressing global issue of inequality. Without further ado, please allow me to welcome to the virtual stage, Sir Richard Blundell. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Great. And uh, it's a real shame we can't all be together, but maybe this will give us the chance to bring in some uh, other people from uh, all around uh, the UK and much further afield. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about inequality and what I thought, it's a huge topic. And as you can see, I thought I'd look a little bit at inequality and the pandemic. Uh, in fact, inequality as we see it, uh, hopefully coming out of the pandemic. The work I'm going to relate to is really about what drives inequality. Uh, why should we care about inequality? Um, what should be done? What should be done now in a post-COVID world? So you see it, these slides, the slides will be on my website and distributed. I think they're clear, but they're, um, it, you're, you can read them at your own pleasure. And, uh, uh, and you can see at the bottom, there's a link to uh, a website with a lot more material on, uh, on this uh, work and this uh, review. In particular, let me tell you a little bit of background about the review, because the timing is rather great for this kind of work. Um, we set about this um, study uh, in 2019, actually, um, funded independently by the Nuffield Foundation. And the idea was to bring together the best available evidence from across the social sciences to answer the big questions about inequality and inequalities. Really, there are so many dimensions of inequality, one couldn't just call it inequality. Um, but which matter most? Some matter less. Some have become more relevant uh, since the pandemic. And I want to focus a little bit on that. We want to think about how different inequalities are related. We've seen plenty of descriptions of inequality. I'll give you some more background, but really the time now is to think about which matter, how they're interrelated and what are the underlying forces that come together to create them. But what's the right mix of policies to tackle the adverse impact of inequalities? I think as economists, we recognize that there always will be inequalities, economic and other inequalities, but our job, in thinking about how to do better, the world, make the world work better, is to make sure we minimize the adverse impact of inequality and keep the economy functioning. We want to look at developed economies, and we'll here in this talk, I'll be thinking about the UK as the running example, but it's comparative in nature. Um, the five year study started in 2019, we're halfway through, and uh, it's time to take. Uh, an assessment of where we are. So I'm going to do that. Uh, measured by standard measures of inequality, the UK is quite unequal, certainly by European standards, less so by world standards. But here I've just pointed um, to a graph. You don't have to read everything on these slides. It's to give you a picture of what's going on to motivate the discussion and the arguments. By the way, we have plenty of time at the end of this session, I'll make sure I finish with plenty of time for questions and I'd be delighted to follow up afterwards if anyone wished to. The Gini is a measure of inequality, a single measure, and you can't capture a lot in a single measure, but it's a one that we like to uh, look at. 
and um, you can see the differences here. There are some parts of Europe, I've highlighted Norway, typically Scandinavia, with relatively low levels of inequality, a genie around 0.25. As we move through Europe, Germany is a little higher, 0.30. Italy is a little higher than that. And as we come to the highest around Europe, we find the UK up there with a genie of about 0.35. Of course, way below the type of inequality measures you would find in the United States, which again are lower than you would find in, say, South America, Latin America, or, or in parts of Africa, for example. Uh, so it's a good time to be thinking about this. We all feel that inequality is just too high. And what should we do about it? Well, of course, <clears throat> inequality is not just about income. That was the genie of income. And we often, as economists, look at inequality in income, but it's by far from the only measure or the most important we should measure. We all know as economists, you know, inequality in wealth is clearly important. Inequalities at work, inequalities in what we consume, what we can consume, inequality in education, inequality in health, inequality in political voice. Those kind of things have become really salient as political polarization has happened and uh, populist governments have been elected. We think inequalities and in attachment, your ability to relate to governing parties is absolutely key. But we need to look at inequalities between groups, not just individuals here. For example, between gender, between male and female, be between ethnic groups, between racial groups, across generations geography. We've just had a huge report policy intervention recently on leveling up. That's about differences in equality across geography and place. They're going to be all important. And of course, we might think we can look at a lot as economists, uh, but we can't cover everything and we can't even hope to think about successful review on inequalities without one, comparing other countries, but most importantly, bringing on other disciplines. And the nature of the review is to do exactly that. That grand picture of the man at the top, that's uh, Sir Angus Deaton. He's a Scot um, and he's the chair of this uh, review and, of course, a Nobel Prize winner. There are plenty of other faces there, including my own there. But a couple of ones to point to, perhaps I could do that. One is on the right, you see Penny Goldberg. Uh, Penny is famous for being chief economist at the World Bank until recently and for her work on trade. And of course, it's obvious after a moment's thought that lots of the concerns about inequality and lots of the drivers potentially of inequality come from trade, globalization, and uh, exactly the way we relate uh, internationally to other countries. But at the bottom on the right is another Nobel Prize winner, Jean Tirole. You may well know of Jean Tirole. And of course, Jean Tirole is particularly famous for his work on market regulation. And you might think, well, what's that got to do with inequality? Well, take for a, a minute the, the way we think about big tech and big companies and markups and large profits. How do we think Amazon? How do we think Google? How do we think Facebook? How do we think Zoom and other modern technical companies that operate in platform technologies, new technologies? We think they're highly important in driving new kinds of inequality. And uh, we really need to understand how these markets work. And now market regulation and competition policy become as much an inequality policy as they are an economic efficiency policy. And then if I point to another person at the bottom there, there's Deborah Satz, probably one of the most famous philosophers of inequality and ethics at Stanford University. So what we're doing here is just bringing in different types of thinking about inequality. And, um, uh, 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 and that's been absolutely key here. But then we're in the middle of our review. In fact, now, almost two years ago, um, we'd started our review, but then along came the pandemic. Uh, 
And for a while, we actually thought, well, you know, inequality will be off the agenda. It'll be it'll be about all about health and all about access to health and uh, survival. But of course, far from pushing inequality down the agenda, the pandemic has reinforced the need to deal with the challenges posed by inequality. It's highlighted many existing inequalities in education, access to education. We'll come back to these in training. Work in work training is absolutely key for many people in getting on in society in the economy. If there's not, if you don't work, you don't get in work training, and we'll see how that's changed during the pandemic. In incomes, obviously, income inequalities have changed. In work, in health, it's obvious, but perhaps mental health as well is as important. In savings, in wealth, think what's happened to the U.S. stock market. Think what's happened to house prices in the UK. By ethnicity and age, think of the different impacts, just the pure different death rates from the COVID across ethnic groups being quite startling. And I don't have to point out the differences by age. But at the same time, there are new inequalities. They were kind of there, but they were previously much less significant. The most obvious one is the advantage of working at home. If you're in a job like mine, <laughs> that I can work at home, uh, then obviously that's been a great advantage, relatively unaffected by the pandemic. If I've got good digital access and plenty of space at home, then if I have a family with young children, I've got space for them to learn, access to di digital technologies for, for both education and for more general uh, getting on in society. So these new fissures have happened, which have created new challenges. And I want to come back to those as we think about. But at the same time, potentially, there's opportunities. Will there be, is there? We're thinking about it now, isn't there? Will there be a new emphasis on building a fairer society? But as economists, we have to worry about the other side of that, the challenge of doing that with unprecedented levels of peacetime debt. How can we think of the right policies here? Perhaps getting the policies right now is really even more important. Or will it be just what has happened in some sense over the last two decades? A huge increase in the demand for e-commerce and, and information technology really spurred on during the pandemic and the resulting increase in the skill premium, in the education premium, and obviously the premium from having space and ability and being in a job which you can work from home. What's happened in this pandemic recession uh, has been quite extraordinary. More or less all countries, and I'll show you some evidence of that, have brought into policies very rapidly, much more rapidly than in standard recessions, to address inequalities. Increases in welfare benefits and social insurance, furlough, have all provided a temporary shield. And the vaccine success, and it certainly has been, has helped speed up the recovery much faster than we originally thought. But of course, new variants, as we've seen, will continue. And the real underlying long-term inequalities the challenges remain. As someone from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, I always think about how we're going to fix things by taxation, redistribution, welfare, but it's quite clear that we can't hope to address these longer run concerns by tax and welfare alone. It's really got to be a balanced policy mix, and I'll come back to this at the end, get some discussion going many common challenges whatever country you're from or currently in will share many of these challenges and so it's also a fine time to be thinking of solutions uh, that we can share across different communities and different countries of course prior to the pandemic inequality was a hugely growing concern perhaps one of the big ones alongside uh, climate change and they're not unrelated, of course, and I'll come back to that. We can discuss that in uh, the discussion. But 
what kind of inequalities, economic inequalities I'm focusing on here become grown? Well, education outcomes and parental inputs uh, varied significantly by social background. So if you had rather connected and wealthy parents as children, you were just getting increasingly more resources in your education than, say, from le lower SES groups. And for those people who didn't manage to get to university or uh, uh, into some good qualifications, there were fewer paths to good jobs. And I'll show you evidence that, in fact, the patterns of work for those who don't make it to education have really fallen back over a long period of two or three decades now. And alongside that, of course, we've had increasing earnings inequality with particularly adverse labor market shocks, especially for men, actually, coupled with poor career progression for low educated workers. So there's been a, a growing divide in society in the world of work, actually. And we've got diverging life cycle profiles where some groups are really not moving. There's almost no progression over their lifetime in work. They're either permanently on something close to the minimum wage and often in receipt of government benefits, whereas others have got very steep trajectories. And if you're doing economics at Warwick, you'll be among the group that have got uh, the prospect of really startlingly good projections, projections, trajectories in their in their career progression. But think of others who are less fortunate. And for those less fortunate, often one way out is on the job training. And in the UK, and just generally more recently, uh, particularly through the pandemic, those have really fallen back. And I'll give you some evidence of that. And what's happened is, um, especially in the UK and the US, we've got increasing in work poverty. With employment alone, increasingly not enough to escape poverty and low earnings. For someone like me, that's quite a, quite a startling thing to happen because um, it was often thought, we often thought that once people were in work, they would work themselves out of poverty. Uh, but with such low earnings and career progression, we find people stuck in low wages and very low career progression. And if they have children, typically in poverty, even if they're on the minimum wage. We get increasing family earnings inequality, despite the growth of women in work. Um, it, it hasn't really offset the inequality between families in their earnings, partly just because of the gender gap. Women just don't do so well in work. And assortativeness, you know, if you're in a couple, uh, married or cohabiting, it's very likely you've got similar education backgrounds. You may have even uh, got together at university or something like that. And so the assortative means that skilled men and women tend to uh, couple together and less skilled tend to couple together, uh, creating uh, increased, if you want, or exaggerated uh, differences in earnings. And there's large differences in the prosperity between different groups. I don't have to tell you about that. Differences in ethnicity. Just look around some of your neighborhoods around Warwick and Coventry, and you can see that, and between different regions. And of course, perhaps one of the things that's been highlighted most is the increases in wealth inequalities, not just financial wealth, housing wealth as well. So they're really the challenges. And if you I put a little figure here just to point out uh, that it's been a relatively successful pandemic as far as inequality in the short term is concerned by simple measures. In fact, if there had been no policy response, inequality in income would have risen shockingly across Europe. Uh, but actually, responses from governments have made meant that inequality has either been pretty stable, as measured by the Gini, uh, or even fallen, and you can see that in this table across a, a number of measures. But most of these measures have been temporary, and many have just finished, as they have more or less in the UK. And anyway, income and the Gini is a very narrow me measure. It doesn't get the effects on long-term impacts of work, of health, of childcare, all the things that we're going to delve into in the next uh, uh, 
15 minutes or so and hopefully have a good discussion of well how do you focus ideas when you're thinking about this uh, whether you're an economist or a social scientist or just trying to get a structure on what kind of economy inequalities are really key how do we organize our thinking it's quite good to do that in a kind of life cycle view and i find this quite attractive you can think of uh, six of these differences uh, broadly speaking across the life cycle of people and families we've got the loss of learnings in in early years in schooling in training schooling inputs as we'll see have varied strongly by socioeconomic class so that those inequalities have become incredibly important but loss of work um loss of work and particularly of falling hours uh, you might have been on furlough but you haven't been working and for many people actually the hours of work and the experience and the knowledge you accumulate in work is really key and we'll see what those gaps look like working from home of course for many of us has been has made work almost uh, unaffected by the pandemic but even if you're working at home uh, there's increased demand for childcare because schools have been closed and of course more men have been doing childcare but the bulk of of the uh, extra childcare has gone on to women and we know many stories of of mothers at home working from home but finding that very difficult as they look after their children but even more for key workers key workers who have to be at work and yet the schools are closed so how do they cope and we'll see um how that might have have, uh, have worked out in families along with that of course even if you're working from home especially if you've got a young family uh, you feel very isolated. I'm sure many students have had periods of quite strong isolation during this pandemic. And the impacts on mental health, especially for the young, actually, at least to beginning, and particularly acute for young mothers, is quite extraordinary and very worrying. Then there's gaps in the social safety net. So as you go through your family life, if you hit bad times, then typically the state jumps in and it jumps in in different ways in different societies um, and what's happened during the pandemic has really highlighted the shortcomings we've had to invent new systems some countries had those quite well in place germany would be a good example the uk had to invent almost overnight a completely new system of furloughing and it's typically the case that things work better if you've got them in place already there's less fraud there's more better monitoring and society can adjust because it understands the way they work and i think that is becoming clearer so perhaps there's going to be pressure there and then as you go through your life savings housing wealth wealth inequalities have all risen during this pandemic so i want to look at it in this way in fact if i start all you need to see here is that there's some lines at the bottom as we go through time from the beginning of the pandemic to the end and there's some lines at the top and this is the proportion of school pupils attending school and these are long periods of time you know months upon months during the school uh, closures of course where even as schools opened there's less than 20 percent of pupils attending school and even when they're fully open there's still a decline and look at these periods you've got long periods of no school or almost no school school holidays then some coming out of lockdown but still nowhere near 100 percent then a second lockdown and a big drop again not quite so bad but still right down among 20 percent of children just those getting in and you can see right through this a really uh, terribly low attachment to schooling in my view thinking back the one thing will 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 uh, say we got wrong in many economies especially the uk and the us with school closures we just found it too easy to close schools and the loss has been tremendously uh, hard on children and on some parents in fact <clears throat> what's really key as far as inequality is concerned is that depending on your background and what we do here is split it into the quint the quintile of your parental background 
what happened to online education what happened to education inputs during those lockdown periods those long months of lockdown almost a half to a years of time lost for some children here and the dark lines are the riches and the light green are the poorest families and you can see the differences are incredible the uh, differences between online classes are almost twice as much among the richest group and um, that's partly what the school was providing but also your ability to access online classes at home if you're sharing space or you have a poor broadband or you have no broadband at all then access was very hard there's a whole lot of measures there and they all really go the same way there's just a strong income gradient in learning that went on during these lockdown periods but even when schools reopened it wasn't really any better because um when children and many were were in self isolation the differences again showed up look at the top line online classes live were you able to access them hugely different between the richest 20% and the poorest 20% and we're getting more and more information on this this is uh, quite important i think but you could say okay so what uh, did it really affect attainment? Well, I can tell you it really did affect attainment. We're getting more and more measures. These are measures of um, <coughs> mean attainment loss by um, by uh, by income group. And I'm looking really at low income groups. This FSM is free school meals. So these are uh, schools with high amounts of free school meals look at the secondary group over here on the right it's just a strong gradient isn't there if you were in a school where there are many children on free school meals uh, then attainment loss over this period was much bigger so there was attainment losses across the board so it wasn't that everybody some groups were doing just as well it appears that attainment has really fallen and you can look at the same things in the US and elsewhere at the grades in mathematics tests, in reading tests, and you'll find it's quite extraordinary the loss and how the loss is concentrated among uh, poorer households. So, this is a big damaging effect for productivity in the economy and the distribution, the inequalities in productivity, which were already there, of course. As we go into work, so as we go through the life cycle, looking at these things, uh, striking uh, is what happened to training. In a way, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? That um, how can you have an apprenticeship if there's no work? And of course, people were employed often on furlough, but in apprenticeships just fell apart. Look at the line for the under 19 year olds and the ones up to 24, let's say. These are largely groups of people who are not making it to university, so they're the other 50%. And they would typically get their human capital after school and, and partly in place of their high school um, through apprenticeships and other work-related training. And the fall more or less completely disappeared in uh, in this lockdown period look at that a seven almost a 70 percent fall so really nothing much going on in terms of training during these uh periods and that's uh that's particularly important given that um over this period uh we we saw already low rates of training this kind of shows up in what's been happening in recent cohorts including to your cohort actually um that generally uh how well people have been doing in work has fallen back this is just averaging across everyone but looking at your birth cohorts by men and women and for a long while it looked like yeah you know after um five after ten years the mean real hourly wage grain you were really gaining from uh, career progression up 20 percent over 10 years for women always slightly less men just do better in the labor market and it's partly due to having children and part-time work and partly of course due to gender discrimination but after the 70s cold as we go into those who were born in the 80s which are the ones we can follow 
into work, of course, easily at the moment, you can see a steep drop back to the point that there's some gains up to five years, then they really flatten out. And what we think here is that career progression has really fallen back and it's particularly fallen back for the low educated. And this is a, a very important uh, concern. When it comes to the pandemic, uh, it's quite interesting to look at what happened to work. Uh, if you look at the headline unemployment rate, it, it, it certainly went up, but not by very much because the furlough system was extremely successful and short-term working in other countries took part of that as well. So the green dots show from the dots to the diamonds, as it were, the increase in unemployment for different groups here. The yellow ones show the increase in working a zero hours as we go from the end of 2019 into the heart of the pandemic, quarter one of 2021. And I just focus on two groups here. Uh, look at the groups that don't have a degree. So the degree dots are exactly the same, nothing. If you had a degree, you were very well insured to this. If you had didn't, if you were below, then you were very likely to end up either more unemployed or certainly on at zero hours and on the furlough. And the jump is extraordinary. It's particularly for the younger group and to some extent the older group. And it's not all a young problem. In fact, the older group have found it particularly difficult to get back to the position. And we know from recent data that um, the fallback in employment and let's say, increase in early retirement among younger groups has, has really increased over the recent months. But you can see here that low educated and young had this particularly important effect. And that's going to be an important thing. It was particularly acute. This is the jump in uh, uh, loss of work, share of work, not working zero hours it jumps up for employees it really jumps up for the self-employed the self-employed were quite protected at least the low income ones through the furlough system but they had no work and so that kind of experience uh, really is important here and by the way the self-employment is something that varies quite strongly across ethnic groups and one reason why um, some ethnic groups were hit particularly hard was their, it, the importance of self-employment in their incomes. And I'll come, come back to a little bit of discussion on um, ethnicity and the pandemic. If we uh, look at the share of workers, excuse me, um, <coughs> by income group. So what I want to do here you could do this easily in any country with any data. Just look at the sectors that weren't in lockdown and see who can work from home and how does that relate to your income. And it's just a strong gradient from one to tenth percentile in the earnings distribution. The low earnings group generally that were not in lockdown were much less likely to be able to work from home. And if you look at those who can work from home, uh, yeah, so the sector's not in lockdown, I should say, much more less, much more likely to be in lockdown if you're a low earner. And more than that, if you're a low earner, much less likely to be able to work from home. So this distributional effect was really important. And as I said, you know, what the pandemic has done is really cut through and emphasized these underlying initial inequalities. Not every country found such an in unequal impact. And I could give you lots of more. And I expect many of you are not from the UK and are interested on comparative things here. The Germany, Germany did comparatively well. And I think it's partly due to what I said, that they have existing systems that have been uh, much more monitored and tried and tested. The US and the UK, it was much more likely that you were uh, uh, um, if that you were a able to work from home if you were in a relatively uh, um, richer, uh, higher earnings. In Germany, that's much less the case, much more systematically 
much more even. And some of these differences are going to come up as we go through the arguments. There's also big differences geographically. So the UK, um, some parts of it have uh, some of the highest ability to work from home. In fact, right at the top here, there's Luxembourg, which has almost no geographical inequality because it's so small, uh, but the UK does. Let me pick on two. If you're from the UK or you know about the UK, you'll know about the levelling up and the differences, particularly between the south, in particular London, and the north, particularly the northeast. And look at this. It's quite startling. In London, nearly 60% of, of workers could work, had their jobs were able to work from home. In the northeast, that shrinks right down towards 30%. So these geographical divides that were already there have been really, you know, emphasized here in a way that was rather unexpected. And you can go through different countries here and pick on them. I won't, um, I won't do that here. But uh, as I said, these challenges and impacts are rather similar, uh, are common across the countries. Yeah, let me look at the UK a little bit more. In fact, I'm going to look at England and Wales. I've cut off Scotland. Angus Deaton wouldn't be very happy about that. And I've cut off Northern Ireland too. Uh, but I could delve into that. But let me look in uh, at um, England and Wales, part of uh, those two nations, part of the UK. And light green here, um, for those of you who know the map, uh, there's light green and dark green. And the dark green is where there's a very high population in the whole working age population with post-A level qualifications. That's mean basically they've got a degree. And look where it is. Um, uh, there's London in the southeast. That's really where it is. But there is some others. There's Manchester. There's Warwick. You can see it there if you stay uh, closely enough. And uh, there are areas where there are higher shares of uh, educated workers, but there are some that are very light where there's really a low level, maybe less than 25%, going below 20%. And that's often in the northeast, the extreme southwest, bits of Lancashire. Those of, of you who are familiar with politics here, uh, Grimsby is a very uh, fine example. We've just had lots of discussion in the levelling up. These are areas that voted uh, Brexit. Uh, they've been a feature of the um, of levelling up debate. They switched from previously being Labour held to Conservative held authorities in the last election. And they're really key. And they're ones which we think of as having very low education attainment. And at the same time, if you do get educated, you leave. And so we can really call those left behind areas. And here's some good examples. Um, let me pick on, well, Grimsby, why not? It's in the middle of, these are all very low um, ones which have particularly uh, lots of um, problems in education attainment. So at the first column is the share of pupils who get degrees. Remember in London, the Southeast, that's over 40%. In Tunbridge Wells, it's like nearly, it's over 40%, 45%. If I go to Grimsby, 19% of children uh, uh, get degrees from Grimsby. That's a really low level of attainment. And uh, But what's more extraordinary is that um, what happens is that those who do get it, even only a few that do, they don't come back uh, to Grimsby. Uh, they don't stay in Grimsby. They leave and go other places, uh, London, Manchester. And so we've got educational flight. That means in the end, uh, we have these extreme differences you saw in that previous picture, um, you know, where there's these areas that have very high levels of educated and very low levels. That has incredible effects from society. What it means is that in those areas, there are relatively fewer educated, of course, young educated, more older people. And you can see the direct impact, the level of quality of education, for example, is much lower in those areas. The level of attainment is lower. This is a real challenge. It's the leveling up challenge, of course. Let me just round up with a couple of more broader inequalities, draw some conclusions and then open uh, to debate. Gender, 
well men did do more childcare, but the bulk of it the bulk of the additional childcare you can see there i won't spend time on it we all know it went to women more than that there's huge rise in those who are unhappy depressed in in the covid era this is covid these are the periods before but look at the outlying group young women particularly young men too but they've all risen and uh, that's a key thing so this huge increase in the incidence of mental health problems is something that uh, will take a long time uh, to address and then finally wealth inequalities uh, you all know about the stock market of course it did a huge dive bomb uh, during uh, during uh, the pandemic at the beginning but in places like the US but even in places like Germany it's increased way above that level and the huge increases in the wealth of people who own stock the UK hasn't been so lucky the UK economy has been the least um, successful uh, since the pre-pandemic area and it just shows up in what's happened to the stock market but there are things in the UK economy that have done very well and house prices are, the, are, are really where it's happened. Housing wealth has, sh has, has risen very strongly, and I haven't even got the last uh, quarter here, and you'd see a huge rise, further rise. And so that aspect of wealth, in particular in the UK, housing wealth, which is so important across generations, if you, you will know, as many of you be the younger generation, uh, for those aged 25 to 34, there's a huge difference uh, between those who uh, are, are homeowners uh, 20 years ago to those who are, are homeowners now. Just look at the difference. If you're really in the lower quintile, quintiles of family income, the levels of home ownership have dropped to way above 50% um, to uh, way under. And that's a really huge differential, a huge generational inequality that's opening up in home ownership so there really are some long-term inequality challenges education challenges all about working from home and access to technology wage and employment in inequalities just that have come through on the increased reliance on technology and home working Generational inequalities, as we just saw, the under 35s more likely to have lost work and reduced earnings. They've had a bounce back, uh, but really that loss in training and work experience for those who don't have degrees is shocking. Gender inequalities, we've seen uh, that women have done much more of the childcare. Although there's been increased childcare, there have been more uh, men doing childcare, but it's still fallen on women and we know it's really children that drive the gender inequalities at work wealth inequality the older higher educated have seen their financial and housing assets increase and so what i've done here is just lay out what i think a good po post-covid policy mix could look like and i'm not going to read through every detail of this i said the slides are there there's a paper too by the way that you're welcome to read um but you the reason i set it out like this is i think it gives you a good guide to how to think through policy not just taxes and benefits you've got to think of how we're going to deal with uh educational disadvantage and diverging educational outcomes the kind of scale of the program required to replace learning loss is is really important and it has to go hand in hand with digital access to allow pupils to harness the benefits of technology vocational skills we've just seen what a key issue that is but at the same time we've got movements in new technologies both e-commerce but also green technologies and so we've got to really rethink vocational training to uh, accompany those two things there's a focus really on skills and matches, firm matches that deliver good jobs. Um, and uh, the gender gap is, is a key one. It was already stalling, by the way. If you look at the Deaton Review, we just put out all the material on the gender gap, and it's really extraordinary. Uh, for a long time, it looked like the gender gap was falling, but it's really the education effect. If you go within education, the gender gap is very flat and we really need and it looks like it won't be helped through the 
uh, pandemic. So we really need policies that address that, particularly around childcare. Differences in prosperity between places, the effect of education flight. Look at Grimsby. How are we going to fix what's happening in Grimsby and Skegness imbued relative to Tunbridge Wells, for example? They're really big questions and uh, everybody's thinking about it, but it needs all these things to come back to really to come to a head to fix them. An increase in generational inequalities, as we've said. I think we kind of know a lot of what to do with wealth. We know that capital gains tax is really poorly designed with a much lower rate um, than on income tax. That just doesn't make sense. Corporate tax, we're getting some movement there. And inheritance tax is, is really poorly designed. M many, most people, as they say, you only pay inheritance tax if you're... Um, um, if, you, if, if, if you're uh, uh, unlucky, if, you, uh, if you're clever enough to figure out how to avoid it, then you largely can. There are good solutions to all of these, and it takes a, the challenges to get government to really do this. And we've seen relatively little change, and it's really the time. And in fact, um, to end my little bit of discussion on a positive note, uh, these there's just such big things happening now that there could be a positive outcome, a change in attitudes and a change in social norms. There's a desire, isn't there, for large scale policies to address these long standing inequalities which have really come to the fore during the pandemic. And we've seen, you can, I picked on a few here, so more people largely large number of people will have experienced the welfare state through the furlough system and through enhanced sickness benefits um safety nets have been challenged so maybe we'll get a new emphasis on a redesign a proper social insurance system a much more effective insurance system uh, that can cover moderate income earners and low income earners uh, when they face uh, bigger offsets like we've seen during the pandemic We've got a large number of lower earners coming out of lockdown and really uh, it, 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 an opportunity now to rethink vocational training, not just more of the old training, but thinking about what skills will complement new technologies. The experience of people working from home could be a tipping point for the change in the way we work. I think that's for sure. Most companies that have the ability to have their employees working from home seem to think that it'll probably be a new equilibrium with a three or four day week at home uh, at work i mean and a couple of days could be at home that means one can live further away from the big cities and perhaps that might spread prosperity across regions uh, that's a great thought i'm not quite sure whether that will really happen Women are more likely to be key workers, by the way, and we've seen the emphasis on looking after key workers, and perhaps that will help women at the same time. The experience of childcare mean that lots of men have had to look after kids, and now maybe they figure it that it's it, it's not an easy thing to do, and perhaps there'll be a, a balance in childcare, in the thinking about childcare that's been so hard to achieve to date, because it's really about changing norms and uh, and then finally, we've got these things coming together, health, economic, education, disadvantage coming together in places and shining a light on pockets of local deprivation. Just look, just imagine you looked at the northeast there, you saw less likelihood of working from home, many more lower educated, a bigger health incidence of um, adverse health incidents of the pandemic. This has kind of forced, hasn't it, an urgency on effective place-based policies that build resilient communities. Nothing's going to happen very quickly, but there are opportunities for a, a real change of heart. So that's it. Probably more than uh, well, it's called more than I I should, but we have a few minutes left, don't we? Um, as I mean for a, a few questions, should there be any? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Blundell. It was an honor to learn about your stance on this pressing issue. We'll now move on to the Q&A section from our audience. The first question, is the, region, is the regional inequality seen in the UK due to an international trend of urbanization? 
and therefore just a natural shift in economic outlook? Good question. I, there is something in that. Uh, you know, what we've seen um, is that a lot of activity is really happening because of agglomeration and agglomeration. Successful cities, London would be one, but there are many around the world have managed to group skills together and people do extremely well attracting new businesses. And if you look at what's happening in tech companies, where are they all going? They're going where the where there are groups of educated workers. And I'm sure, you know, the graduates from Warwick are going to end up in thriving cities. But we just don't have enough. You know, why why can't we replicate uh, a thriving city like London elsewhere? in the UK. I think it does point though to something I think going under underlying what your question is asked. You're not going to be able to spread thriving cities everywhere. Uh, so you have to focus. And a lot of what's thought of is leveling up is spreading what I would say spreading too thin. And so it won't exploit agglomeration. And my guess is it won't be very successful at all. One has to recognize that these kind of bringing together of skills in a place and the thrivingness of, of that kind of activity that goes on in thriving cities, perhaps working from home or allow that to dissipate a bit. But I think what we need to understand is, you know, what makes cities thrive? Can we replicate that elsewhere? Let's get the productivity of thr thriving cities happening elsewhere. That's as true in France, Paris is doing pretty well. There are other cities that aren't. It would be true in many, many other other uh, economies around the world. Thank you, Professor. I believe that wonderfully answers our audience questions. Um, the next question is, how should we balance catching up on education missed during the pandemic and promoting good health and well-being to young people? Can both occur simultaneously? Um, it's really uh, good. There's a lot of aspects of health and education that have really uh, been highlighted, you know, so not just physical health, but mental health. And, uh, you know, I think all, all young people understand uh, the, the problems of, of mental health, especially from being isolated or just communicating like this um, over the inter internet. So one could say, ah, look, you know, if we distribute digital very heavily, we get everybody to catch up digitally, then that's the solution. I think it is partially the solution. You know, we're going to have to have a, a massive rollout of um, of digital learning and catch up uh, happening. Uh, it's very hard to do that, by the way. You know, if your if your parents are not very educated, then they may and don't have the space to do that. So school opening and keeping them open is is really key there. But this long term impact of both education and health, perhaps if we can get children back in school and get them interacting and having fun as well, then we can uh, address both mental health and education disadvantage. But those two things are already there, have just got much, much worse. So I think it, it could be the most pressing problem, really, as we come out of this pandemic is just dealing with education disadvantage at the same time as mental health disadvantage, possibly also the impact of long COVID, which we still, of course, a complete unknown to us. Thank you. Another very popular question seems to be, with COVID layoffs globally, do you believe that structural change in developed economies will accelerate causing structural unemployment, which may further deepen the inequality? Yeah, that's the fear. I kind of mentioned that, you know, the, it's almost the main challenge, you know, will we try and fix society in a fair way? Um, but, you know, uh, there's, there's deficits, there's all kinds of things to fix. We need tax income uh, and what's happening in technology and, uh, and firms and society is really that, you know, if you have skills, uh, then you can complement technology and you'll do very well. And I'm afraid with my economics hat on, I just see that's the way it's going to go, that e-commerce and IT is going to be uh, hugely in demand uh, increasingly. And those who are unable to uh, to provide work in those kind of sectors will do less well. And, you know, that will increase the divides that are already there. We can do things about that, but skills and matching skills with technologies is, 
you know, it's as simple as it sounds, but really hard to implement, uh, must still be uh, the way forward, I would say. I believe we have time for one more question. Okay, great. How should we tax the rich in developing economies like India, where they are often the main contributors to industry? Yeah, good point. Well, often the rich, you know, <laughs> you know, one can be pretty tough on the rich, but it, it, just think of the top ten richest people in the U.S. Um, they're all, uh, or at least eighty percent of them, are entrepreneurs, and the top, the top of any thriving economy, any any economy the top one percent will have a lot of business and entrepreneurs of course it'll have the rentiers and those who are living off uh, historic profits and inheritance but you know you've got the jeff bezos you've got um all, all all the different guys there i think the key in economic terms is getting uh thriving innovation they were innovators we don't want them to grab their spot and keep other innovators out it's you know, it's about creative destruction, of course, and many of you will know about that. Very hard to to harness. But I think what we've got to be able to do is redistribute and at the same time keep creativity uh, going. In an economy like India, that's uh, very important. And I think, you know, if anything, um, in certain sectors in India, including IT, actually, um, and and of course in uh, medical products uh, has been very very successful it could do more but you know we're we're really not um not accessing all that human capital um well enough so i think that it's pretty simple that we do have to tax the rich a little more redistribute but redistribute in a way that can uh, produce a creative economy and uh, so that's a kind of clever taxation and a clever redistribution and um there are ways of doing that that can be fairer uh, unfortunately you know in the world there are a lot of vested interests and um and vested interests will lobby against uh fair taxation often and that's really the key problem why don't we have uh, a more fairer tax system on uh, on certain aspects of property and capital taxation and i'm sure the same would be true in India, um, and the reason is is that the uh, the donors to parties and the uh, powerful often have vested interest in keeping things as they are. So I think it's a radical agenda as well in trying to get this right. While we were on the topic of taxation, uh, another question asks: How effective are wealth taxes as a means to combat inequality, considering how easy it is for the wealthy to move? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Well, you have a, a, a very great colleague in Arun Vadi who works on wealth taxation, your, your professor at um, Warwick. And uh, I think we think we could do a lot better. Um, so I think, again, you should be um, wary of people saying, oh, I don't tax, tax the wealthy because they're all go. The evidence is, that, you know, that elasticity is there, but it's not that strong. But the real answer is coordination. Um, you know, it's very hard for one single smaller country in a globalized world to, to tax uh, differentially because people do move. They don't really even have to move. They just have to move uh, their, their, where their income is taxed. And we know that's relatively easy. And in some sense, it's not a difficult thing to do. And we just saw the coordination of the minimum tax on corporation being pretty effective. It's a low tax rate, by the way, 15, but um, it's still effective. But that's one trend. But generally, I think the trends are going the wrong way. You know, if you look in Europe, um, you know, the UK just left the EU. The EU would be a very, very good place to have coordinated taxation. And one reason... Uh, the UK put for leaving is so that it could set its own taxation. So that's not very good. But you do see some coordination. You know, the low tax economies in our European, my our European neighbours like Ireland, and to some extent countries like the Netherlands on certain aspects of capital taxation, have been forced uh, to increase their taxes. And you've just got to be able to do that. And so I think it it's a matter of uh, fairness it's a matter of coordination 
but you're right the question is absolutely right you can be very you know very optimistic about things overly optimistic because uh, people do find ways of uh, of shifting out of uh, their wealth and their incomes and so you just have to be clever so i i'd say be smart taxes and also be coordinated taxes and we're kind of learning how to do that but um you know we're in a globalized world we don't want to shut down the globalized world to just tax wealth we want people to be able to move and uh get exploit all the advantages of a globalized world and that really means we have to operate in our policies as a globalized world and maybe we're beginning uh, to learn uh, our interconnectedness and how important that is for policy and everything else that's we're up thank you so much <laughs> for clarifying the answer so comprehensively unfortunately that is all we have time for today i would like to convey my sincerest thanks to both professor blundell and our speaker for this engaging session yeah great i really enjoyed it thanks for inviting me thank and, you for uh, being here to uh, do look at my website if, and the uh, Deaton Review website if you need more material. Thank you very of much. Course. Thank you.